Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. I'm Chris Horner. This is Dwarfsdorf Vlanderen, 188 kilometers, about 115 miles in length for this 2024 race. Now, when we're looking at this race, when the cameras come on, guys, it is absolutely chaos everywhere trying to figure out what's happening. I'm not going to do this race justice. It comes on with over 100 kilometers to go. You need to watch 100 kilometers in order to understand what I'm talking about up here on the butterfly effect and to just experience what this bike race was like today here at Dwarfsdorf Landon because it was something magical every kilometer of the full 100K. Now, the main thing I'm going to try to do is break down some of the tactics of what's going to happen on today's race while it's happening. It's a difficult scenario for any director sportif that's in the car 100%. I would not like to be the director sportif sitting back there trying to figure out what my riders should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing here at Dwarfsdorf Landon because when the cameras come on, 11 riders in the front group. The main thing you want to pay attention to when you see this 11 riders, they got two and a half minutes. No big deal, right? It's only two and a half minutes. You got over 100 kilometers to go. But the main thing, 11 riders, 11 different teams. When we go back and look at the peloton, we see it's Visma that's on the front. We see Bora Hansgrohe and we see it's Trek trying to keep everything under control here with about 100 kilometers to go. Once we start getting under 100K, guys, they're on a five lane road. They're going downhill 70 kilometers an hour. They're 15, 17, 20 riders wide and about seven deep. It's total madness right now. If you were in the race trying to experience it for the first time in your career, you would probably just hit the brakes and say, I'm done. I don't need this race. I got Tour of Flanders coming later. And this is just absolutely madness. When you look at five lanes wide, it's craziness. The road narrows up. Now we're going down to about maybe three, two lanes there. And now we're talking about a 10 wide peloton. And then it's going to go into a right turn into a super crazy, narrow, technical right turn that's going to string the field completely out. And everybody's going full gas. The group of 11 is still intact. They're going to lose one rider here pretty soon. But just right now, when we look back, we see it's Trek. Trek has got everything under control. Remember, they won the last race with Mads Pedersen, right? Well, things are going to be extremely different at the end of today's Dwarves Door Flandering, but Trek have everything under control. We see Wout, the big guy from Visma Lisa Bike, he's always in good position at this point in time with over 90 kilometers to go. And Benny M. Germay, I highlighted him yesterday on Beyond the Coverage, and he looks fantastic when we're still 90 kilometers to go here at Dwarves Door Flandering. They hit the next climb chaos. That's why it was going 70 kilometers an hour down a five lane road. And that's why it was still going mock speed when we got to a two, three lane road. And that's why it still went mock speed on the smaller road because the next climb's coming up. Trek have everything under control. They slow it down just a bit. How do I know they slow it down? The group of 11, 10 riders up the road, they're not, they're not losing time like they were all the way back there when the Peloton was going 70 kilometers an hour. Now they get up to the top, we're about 90 kilometers to go. Trek get onto the front and they start disintegrating everybody. We'll see Lawrence Pithy from FDJ. He has a bike issue on the side of the road. And when we look at the front, it's three FDJ riders driving it on the front because that's Stefan Kuhn. Right now, if I'm the director sportif, I'm pulling every teammate I have that's left in the race going back for Lawrence Pithy with the exception of Stefan Kuhn because we all know the Swiss rider is a classic rider and he's usually on pretty good form in these spring races. So I don't pull Stefan Kuhn, but every other rider I pull back there for Lawrence Pithy. And if I'm wrong, so what? What are they going to be able to do for Stefan Kuhn at this moment when the race is going ballistic? And you got a rider that's been as spectacular as Lawrence Pithy back there that's having a bike issue. Pull the whole team unless, unless you want Pithy to just use today's race and just go, hey, scratch it off. We're going to scratch here, Doris Dorf Landeren, and we're going to focus on, of course, Sunday's race tour of Flanders. So Pithy, don't even worry about, don't try to get back on. But every time the cameras come on, I see Pithy back there struggling like crazy. When the peloton's blown up in pieces, at least three, if not four echelons, and Pithy's in the last one back there with no team help. He's out of the picture. Forget about him. Let's go back up to the front. About 80 kilometers to go. We'll see it coming into a right turn. Trek is at the front. Ender Marche's Benium Grimay is in a good position. But look back there as they came into this right. That's Visma Lisa bike, the big guy, Wout Van Art. He's in a bad position here with about 80 kilometers to go. Don't worry. Clearly, he's got form because we're going to see him back at the front really soon. And he's going to have Van Dyke up there. Jorgensen's going to be up there. T. Spinute. And, of course, Wout himself 
is up there and we're coming under 80 kilometers to go somewhere about 75. Now things get real interesting as we look at the Peloton up there of what you want to call a Peloton 60 70 guys max but all the big time favorites are in here minus pithy that I told you already got dropped. We're coming in at 67 kilometers to go we'll see a crash right there that's Lawrence Rex from Intermarche. If we look at the crash how it happened there was a little bit of breaking on the left side of there the Peloton of GC favorites and then Lawrence Rex goes down hard. Peloton comes back on camera and we look at the front. EF Education's there, but now look, there's a little bit of a crash. Then the camera goes all the way back to the helicopter aerial views. It's a massive crash happening right behind EF Education, and we'll see everybody of the big time favorites is going down. Mads Pedersen's going down. His two teammates, Stoyven's gone down. Alex Kirsch has gone down in the national championship jersey. The big guy, Wout Van Art's gone down, and you can hear him coming through the camera camera on your television about the cries that he's yelling out in pain so we know Visma Lisa bikes Wout Van Art, he's not going to get back up in this race. We start looking at some of the other favorites. Biniam Germay went down. When I look and see how it happened, it's a terrible angle. I'm going to break it down the best I can with a little bit of help from the interview that Tis Benut gave after the race. He says, we see him side by side up at the front. We got four Visma Lisa bikes up there. Tis Benut's in front of Wout Van Art. His words, not mine. As he says, Wout Van Aert told him he's got to go because Trek's coming on the left side. He moved over to the left. Looks like he bumped the wheel of Alex Kirsch. Now let's look at the front picture from the peloton as we see Jorgensen, Matteo Jorgensen, the winner of Perry Nice. Look at the wheel right there coming on to Jorgensen. I think it's a front wheel, but it could be a back. As we see Jorgensen's just dodging that wheel there and trying to stay upright. He just barely dodges it. Now the Trek bike goes flying all the way over to the left. We see the Albus seen the Koenig rider. That's Gianni Vermesh right there that's flying in the air. Just behind him we see that Benny and Grimai crash in there and then in the center there it's the main crash there that Wout Van Art that's going down. He's going down hard. Guys, we'll see his mechanic running over to give him a bike. When I'm sitting on the Chesterfield I'm like he doesn't need a bike today. He's going to need a bike for the Tour de France because he is not going to the Giro guys. When I brought up these two jerseys here I brought it up because my plan when I won the Vuelta Espana in 2013 and I rode later for Lampre was that I would do the Giro that was coming up in May. I crashed about the time of Perry Roubaix. I broke four ribs, spiral fracture, punctured them in there, popped, popped a hole into my right lung, cracked the shoulder up here. And like I said, my schedule was the Giro just the same as Wout Van Aert. But his schedule, I guarantee you, is going to be the Tour de France. Now, assuming everything can heal because he's got broken ribs and broken collarbone and he's not going to be the only one that's not getting up. When we look there in the center and look at all the Trek riders there, Mads Pedersen was trying to throw the bike off him. He couldn't get it off. The Intermarche rider, Gianni Vermash, he was limping off to the side. Benny and Grimai will eventually get up, but he'll have some help. But we'll see that Wout Van Aert will have to get put up on the stretcher and get brought out because his broken bones are certainly going to end today's race. And I guarantee you that the Giro's out of the picture unless they can pull miracles. So we're going to see the big guy, Wout Van Aert, at the Tour de France. Now my friend, he texts me afterwards, one of my home skillets, and he says, the big time winner in this crash right here has to be Matthew Vanderpool. I said, I don't think so. Matthew Vanderpool is going to have all eyes on him at Tour of Flanders. The biggest advantage right here of any riders has to be Jonas Vinigo because the big guy's going to the Tour de France. It's going to alter everything in July. So Tour of Flanders might be changed, but July is going to get a whole lot more exciting, I think. Now we go up to the front of the peloton. We're hitting the Canary Berg. It's 65 kilometers to go thereabouts. And we look, it's Matteo Jorgensen on the front throwing in a huge attack. He's got his teammate Tis Benut on his wheel. We look behind him. EF Education got two riders in there. That's Michael Valgreen and Alberto Betio, the fifth rider in this group. Stefan Kuhn, FDJ. He's made the split. Then we see Johnny Milan. He's in there from Trek. Somehow he's holding on for dear life. The first rider to open up the split, that's going to be Michael Matthews, Jaco as he starts to hurt from the pain of the speed there from Jorgensen. He opens up the gap. We got five, six riders now trying to go up the Canary Berg right here until Johnny Milan blows. He blows. That leaves five guys going over the top of Matteo Jorgensen's going full gas with Tis Benut. And of course, the EF Education riders, Valgreen, Alberto Betiel's pulling through full gas. And then we see Stefan Kuhn. He's not missing a pull at all. 
five big time names still left at the top of the canary bird going full gas, trying to bring back what's left of about eight, nine, ten riders in the original breakup here, but they're only at about a minute. Now the break starts falling apart. The five leaders back there, they're trying to win today's race. They're coming up closer and closer to the front group, but they're not going to catch to about 35k to go. Let me back the film up just a hair because Josh Tarling was doing something amazing. I have no idea where he came from, but the Ineos rider is flying and solo trying to come across to this group just before they're catching the break. They'll catch the break. Josh Tarling will somehow find his way magically onto this front group. His legs must have been amazing if he'd caught the split originally when, at, when they went up to Canaryburg. You know he'd have some form left, but now when I'm sitting on the Chesterfield, I gotta wonder, how much form does Josh Tarling have right here when he catches up to this front group? We'll call it about a dozen riders up here, but I could be wrong. There's chaos throughout this whole race. These things, what I'm telling you now, might not even be facts, but then we'll call it 12 guys. They're going full gas. We're under 34 kilometers to go. And then we start seeing the first guys falling off the front, and that's Casper Asgreen coming out. He was one of the original breakaway riders that started this break with 11 riders. Now he's coming out the back. He's fighting like crazy to get back onto the front. He catches back up to the guys. He comes off again, squeezes every ounce of energy he's got in his legs to get back on for a second time. And then the third time, he gets popped. And while he He's getting popped. We see that his total energy is Thomas coming off. Acorn from Lotto and Deporter from Intermarche comes off. Now we're start getting the group smaller and smaller, but we still got a couple of the original breakaway guys who started this race in the front group. That's the bump from AG2R, and that's Abrahansen up there from Uno X. Somehow they're still in this front group with some top top power up here with Stefan Kuhn and Jorgensen, the winner of Perry Nice, along with Tis Benut. Now let's back the film up just a little bit. I left one detail out. I apologize. Let's Let's look at it when there was five guys chasing the original 10 guys up there from the break and what was left back there of the guys chasing because we'll call it about 25 riders. Now, if you're the director sportif, which I really want to focus on some of the tactics, how do you call this race? Well, if you're the guys up in the original break, remember, they're all different teams, so remember that, and you got five guys chasing that are from different teams now, three different teams chasing the group up front, and then in the back, when you look back there, it's Albacine de Kunick chasing, that's Soren Craw Anderson. But when you look at the other guys in that group of 25 in what I'll call the third group, they got teammates up in the first group because Julian Alaphilippe, the Frenchman, two-time road world champion, he's in that group trying to get up to the front group to see if he's got any form. But Casper Asgreen's in this front group, so Julian's sitting on. And as I told you, when I, we go back up to live now, Casper Asgreen's gotten popped after the first acceleration with a few other breakaway guys. But the director Sportiz, when we back it back up, what were they thinking? At some point in time, you got to go, okay, how do I work this out? If you got a writer in that group of 25 and a writer up there in that group of 10 up there in the original break, if that guy's feeling bad up here, he's got no power left, he's got to sit on. He's got to stop working because he's got teammates in that group of 25 and powerful five group writer that's, kind of, that's certainly going to close the gap to you. So if you're the director sportif, I can't tell you up here who should be working and who shouldn't because I don't know how their legs are feeling. But once I saw Casper Asgreen getting popped three different times with under 30, under 30 kilometers to go, we know that Pseudo Quickstep made a bad decision unless unless Julian Alaphilippe said, Casper, I don't have any form either. Casper asked, said he didn't have any form. Well, then you just play it out. That's why it's a tactical nightmare here at Dwarfsdorf Flander. Now, the three, three guys are coming off the back. Like I said, we're under 30 kilometers to go. Stefan Kuhn is going to put in the first attack with 27 kilometers to go. Now, I said today's race was incredibly complicated, but this is a knucklehead move. You do not want to put in the first attack at this moment with 27 kilometers to go because you have not one but two Visma Lisa bike riders in there but Stefan Kuhn from FDJ he's not thinking with his head he's thinking only with his legs and he's got some powerful legs so he's got riders coming out the back like Josh Charlie who somehow is holding these guys and Tis Benut just in front of him Tis Benut gets on the radio right away you see him talking because Jorgensen started to pull through he, he hears that Tis Benut's on the radio saying don't pull don't pull I'm coming back man have some faith do not pull Stefan Kuhn because I'm coming back on. We'll see that there with Tis Benut, he'll find his way back on. And Josh Tarling, I don't know how he's doing it, but somehow the time trial specialist keeps finding his way back on. Now the next big attack's coming from Alberto Betiel. 
Walgreens already gotten dropped by the acceleration there. Then the first attack from Stefan Kuhn. And now we'll see Alberto Betiol put in a huge attack with about 21, 19 kilometers to go, thereabouts. It's a massive attack from the EF Education Rider, and it looks like he's got fabulous form. When I was sitting on the Chesterfield, I was like, oh man, this is my outright favorite right here. And then, man, was I a knucklehead, because just a kilometer, kilometer and a half later, we see Alberto Betiol cramp up, and his race here at Dwarfsdorf Landerns done, and his teammate Valgreen already got dropped. So we see it's elite group of about six, seven riders, depending on if you want to count Tarling or not, but somehow the Enios rider just keeps finding his way back on. The next attack, again, it keeps coming from Stefan Kuhn, but he keeps getting brought back. Tis Benut's throwing in attacks. He knows he doesn't have the legs to go all the way to the line, but every time he throws in attack, it's the same kind of attack that we saw with Jonathan Milan back there just over the weekend where we saw Jonathan Milan at Ghent Wevel again there just going up the road so he can put pressure on Matthew Vanderpool. That's what T. Spinut's doing, trying to put pressure on everybody in this front group so Jorgensen can get a free ride. But T. Spinut always has some company and is always brought back. We get into the last and final attack from Stefan Kuhn. He's throwing everything he can into it. He's hurting everybody, but Jorgensen's always there. Then we see everything come back. We'll see T. Spinut throw an attack. Then Jorgensen throws in a massive attack with seven kilometers to go. Look at the picture from the helicopter angle. Then I'll show you the picture from the front. The helicopter angle is there with Stefan Kuhn looking over the side. You can't see it too well, but when you look at it from the front, Stefan Kuhn's looking over. Mateo Jorgensen's going up the road with seven kilometers to go. Everybody's legs are just smoked back there. And with the hesitation from Stefan Kuhn, Abrahamson from Uno X, that means that Jorgensen's got a gap. He comes up to the next right turn. Now the next important thing at 6.5 kilometers to go, guys, look at the flags. When he makes the right, it's a tailwind. If you do a big hit through the crosswind section and then you're a solo rider going in the tailwind, the wind is going to push you and give you a little bit of recovery so you can get back on the pedals 10, 20 seconds later after that recovery. And if the group behind hesitates at all, and they're all hesitating, debunked back there from AG2R was hesitating. I told you Alberto Betiel's already dropped, so he's not in there. But Stefan Kuhn was hesitating. We see that Eberhansen, he hesitated just a hair, and now the gap's gone out to about 22 seconds. One more last little bump rise in the road. Stefan Kuhn throws everything into it with about four, four and a half kilometers to go. But Tis Benut is locked all over the FDJ riders as now the gap goes up with three kilometers to go up to almost 30 second gap up there to Matteo Jorgensen. Once he comes under two kilometers to go, you know he's going to win it. So now what's happening back there with the group? Well, we see there's one more attack by Abrahamson there from Uno X. He throws that in with about 2.2 kilometers to go. Tis Benut's chasing full gas going through the right turn and he'll bring him back. Up front, it's one kilometer to go. Jorgensen's got over a 30 second gap. He'll come into the final right bend at 400 meters. He'll start celebrating at 200, and he's won the first Dorstor Flandin for the US right here for Visma Lisa bike on what was nothing less, less than a magnificent, absolutely beautiful Dorstor Flandin victory for the American rider and the Perry Nice winner already. Jorgensen's having a dream season in 2024. Behind, what happened? Well, we see Debunk come out of the right turn at 400 meters to go. He comes in there full gas, and then we see Abrahamson start his acceleration at about 250. He'll hold it all the way to the line. Stefan Kuna get a podium. Fourth would be Tis Benut. The bump from AG2R get fifth. Sixth on the stage. That's going to be Tarling. And then we're going to see Johnny Milan. Johnny Milan gets a top 10 here. If I back you all the way up to about 16 kilometers to go, Johnny Milan is catching some of the remnants there of what was dropped out of the front original break of 11 riders. And he's yelling over there at Casper Asgreen. He's going, Casper, come on. We can do it. You could literally hear him on the video saying, we can do it. We can catch. Man, I don't know if you could catch, but you still got a top 10. So Johnny Milan, nice ride here for Trek. Now, when everything's said and done, tactically is a difficult, complicated stage. But Stefan Kuhn said in his interview that, of course, everybody was watching him. Honestly, Stefan Kuhn, you wrote it not very tactically smart. You were a knucklehead when you started the tax. You should have waited for, of course, Visma Lisa bike to start the tax or EF Education. But they blew up early, so then the next guys to watch is going to be Tis Benut and Jorgensen. Once they split it, 
When you're in that group with only one Visma Lisa bike, that's when you start attacking. So the mistake was always to be attacking first, having Jorgensen sitting on your wheel. Then Tis Benut a lot of times was sitting on the wheel of Josh Tarling back there from Enos. So he's getting a free ride, Jorgensen's getting a free ride, and in the end you attack too many times and that's why you lost today's Dwarfsdorf Vlander and of course to a fine flying form Jorgensen from Visma Lisa bike who when I take you all the, way, all the way back to the Canary Bird, guys, they didn't even hesitate. That was less than two kilometers after the crash from Wout Van Aert, and they already had their plan B in motion after Wout Van Aert went down that Jorgensen was still going to light it up on the Canary Bird. So congratulations, Visma Lisa bike. You guys were spotless. Only, only one tiny, tiny little mistake from Jorgensen, but Thies Benut fixed that when he got on the radio, and they take a spectacular win because of the experience there from Thies Benut saying, Jorgensen, I'm coming. Sit on Stefan Kuhn. Fantastic day tactically, of course, for Visma Lisa bike after that radio call in, and we know it's going to be a fantastic tour of Flanders, even though the big guy, Wout Van Aert's out, but he's going to be at the Tour de France, I guarantee it. Like and subscribe. I'll see you guys for Sunday's Butterfly Effect for Tour of Flanders.